various applications of infrared, introduce you a little bit to uh, thermal imaging itself, and then also discuss why training is important, why we have certification and whatnot. Uh, before we start today's session, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. On the screen here in front of you, everybody should see the listening options that are available. Obviously, hopefully, you can hear us at this point. Uh, two options there are the mic and speakers or also the telephony option there uh, as well. Uh, your window, or your desktop, I should say, uh, should look something similar like this, where you've got the GoToWebinar layout there with the main presentation window. Off to the right-hand side is your control panel. That control panel is where you will have the ability to ask questions. Uh, we've muted all attendees to reduce background noise for today's session, uh, but you can still ask questions, and that's via this Q&A panel. During the session, feel free to chat in any of those questions there via that Q&A panel. I've got Jason here. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And he'll be on there coordinating those questions. He actually might answer some of those uh, directly back to you in that Q&A chat window. Uh, others, though, we will answer uh, at the end of the session here in about 45 minutes uh, to an hour or so. All right. We'll get, uh, we'll get right into it. We'll start here with the basics. Uh, really, uh, one of the more requested topics that we have out there. Uh, really designed to provide for you an overview of, of really what infrared thermography is, how it's used, and, and really some of the uh, more things that you should be aware of, if you're, especially if you're new to the technology. I'm going to start off briefly just with an introduction in ITC. Uh, we'll get into uh, what is infrared thermography and just briefly discuss it compared to, let's say, other uh, technologies such as night vision. How does infrared compare with night vision and visual as well? And then cover some of the applications of infrared, more of the, the common, more we call condition monitoring type applications, electrical, mechanical, get into some building systems, uh, some flat roofs, low slope roofs, and show you just a few of the, the uses there, and then wrap it up with a fairly comprehensive overview on, on why you need infrared training. Uh, and it's not, again, not a sales pitch as much as it's more of a really what you should know, what you don't know, and why we have training. This, this, these cameras you know, may be very easy to use, uh, but it's analyzing the data that's really the most challenging aspect of this technology. And we'll just share with you a little bit of what we do cover in our training classes here to provide some, really some theoretical background on things like emissivity, reflectivity, uh, indirect heating, all of those things that are really important for a thermographer to understand. And as I said here, we'll wrap it up with some questions uh, towards the end of the hour. Uh, for those of you that have questions, you can send those in uh, here during the webcast uh, throughout the session here. Uh, just a quick background on myself. I've been with ITC since uh, 2013, uh, but I've been in the industry for over 13, almost 13 years here now, uh, doing level one and level two thermography instruction. So I'm one of the trainers here at ITC, uh, obviously delivering classes to uh, individuals from around the United States. Uh, we actually have a level one class coming next week here to our Boston Regional Training Center. And when I'm not in the classroom, I provide uh, technical support to help develop training content. Uh, here at the office, I manage these live webcasts, I help out with social media, representing ITC also at industry-related conferences and whatnot. Uh, but my primary job here is as a level one and level two uh, thermography instructor. Before we go any further, I just wanted to... Uh, well, first off, here's our training center, by the way. This is out of our Nashua office. We'll be here next week with a level one class uh, and followed by a level two. So a great facility here that we have uh, available to us. We will be utilizing a lot of this uh, during uh, our, our training, but also during today's webinar. We, we actually get into some of the, the labs that we have set up in this training room. Uh, we actually will, will feature a few of those here on this particular session to church, really try and reinforce the principles of thermography and what a, a thermographer really needs to know to be uh, successful with the technology. But obviously we're here more for you, those of you that are joining us. I wanted to take a quick poll, try something new here. We've been doing, trying to do more of these polls here to get an idea of the audience. And I just want to know what is your level of training and or certification? I'm going to launch a poll here off to the, uh, uh, I should say the, that side of your screen, whatever, the, uh, the right side there if I got that right. Uh, just take a moment, please, if you could please answer these questions. What is your level of training and or certification? To get an idea here uh, how new you might be or perhaps you're a veteran thermographer. 
You'd be surprised. Even with a basics course, we do get a lot of uh, people that are level two, level three, uh, that come on uh, during the uh, uh, during the sessions, which is great. I mean, really, we try to keep these very basic uh, to sort of get an idea of, uh, uh, you know, to give you an idea, obviously, of, of really what what goes into the technology. But for those of you that maybe want a refresher, this certainly serves that purpose as well. Uh, looks like the most of you by far are new, new to infrared, have had no formal training whatsoever. Uh, second most there, basic camera operation, and then a few, looks like a few level ones and level twos. Well, that's excellent. Good, that helps us out here to get, a, to get an idea of, of who we're talking to here today. Let me close that poll. And I'll come back to the main presentation here. Hopefully we can see that. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, we'll get right into it. Well, what is infrared thermography? This is really the formal definition of infrared thermography, the process of analyzing uh, and acquiring uh, really basically what's infrared radiation, the total radiation coming from an object to basically either measure or, or evaluate its temperature or evaluate thermal patterns on the surface of that material. I'm actually going to mute that webcam here for a little bit too so we can focus on the questions as well. Really a technical, very formal definition there, uh, but what these cameras see is infrared radiation, which is actually a form of electromagnetic energy. And of course, the universe is filled with all these various forms of electromagnetic radiation, everything from gamma rays, x-rays, to ultraviolet light. Of course, visible light is what we see, but then there's infrared microwaves and radio waves. Uh, these are all, again, this is all a form of electromagnetic energy. Infrared is just one portion of the overall electromagnetic spectrum. Of course, much of this, almost, almost all of it, is invisible to the human eye. We just see visible light with our eyes. But these infrared cameras that we use actually detect the heat radiation emitted by objects. That total energy to, eva again, evaluate thermal patterns, but also try to uh, measure temperature as well. And we'll get to a little bit more of that here later in the broadcast. But there are some things that in terms of you know the similarities, there are in the fact you know the fact that visible light and infrared energy are are electromagnetic energy, uh, the similarities in many ways stop there. I mean they do travel at the speed of light, uh, can go through a vacuum, it has a waveform. Uh, but beyond that, that's where those similarities stop. Uh, this visible light picture you see here is actually hanging in our office. This is what's on the left here. Uh, and this is just a color photograph that we see with our eyes and all the various colors there that are utilized in this, in this image. Well, it's a visible light photo. It's what we see. It's what we're most familiar with. Infrared, again, does not see visible light at all. It sees the heat emitted by objects. And if we look at this thermally, this same picture here, you notice now here on the right, all of those colors are gone because the cameras don't see light. They see heat. And additionally, what you can see here on the right is my thermal handprint. I rested there on the wall for a moment just to sort of demonstrate how we can leave these heat signatures behind by warming up or cooling off surfaces. Something that you do not see in the visible light image there on the left. So just a quick demonstration there of what really the difference is between the visible world and the thermal world. Uh, something I, found, I thought was very interesting. Uh, often infrared is confused uh, with night vision. People think, oh, infrared is the same as night vision. There's actually a distinct difference between the two. You see, infrared, or thermal imaging, actually detects the heat emitted by objects, as I mentioned. Uh, completely unaffected by light sources. Requires no visible light to operate whatsoever. Whereas night vision uh, actually amplifies small amounts of visible light radiation. And with that, you need some type of a light source, whether it's something as simple as moonlight, or perhaps an LED illuminator that actually lights up the scene. On the left, we see here what visually what these cups look like sitting on this table. They're brown, hot coffee cups. There's actually a, a thin piece of window glass sitting there right in front of them on a wooden block. Behind them is a, a white painted wall, and then there's sort of the hard, firm surface there of the table. As they're resting on that table there, it's a darker surface, darker colored surface. Well. Visually, we can see the colors of those cups. Thermally, though, on the right here, we don't see the color. Instead, we see the heat or the differences here, either cooler or warmer. One cup obviously uh, appears to be filled with cold water, the other one with hot water. 
You notice here too, behind the cups emerges a pattern on the surface of the wall. This thermal pattern here of the framing, which we do not see in a visible light image. Night vision again is sort of the wavelengths in between visible and infrared energy. These are near infrared wavelengths uh, of, of energy there. And again, this we're seeing this because the scene is either being lit by some type of an illuminator coming from LEDs or perhaps other light, sort of low light ambient light that's available in there as well. So very, very brief, brief sort of introduction there. I want to share with you some of the basics of, of IR in terms of the applications. Where is this technology that sees heat utilized? Uh, really, the applications are endless. It's across many different areas, not just electrical and mechanical, which is what many tend to think of, uh, doing you know, electrical systems and motors and whatnot. Uh, it's utilized in, in, in a variety of areas. I'm going to just share with you a few of what those are. Uh, electrical systems, probably being the most popular on the sort of the condition monitoring side, uh, at least up until recently, uh, we can find lots of things like uh, high resistance electrical connections, overloads, imbalances, uh, because these things will reveal a certain thermal pattern. You see the power, the electrical energy in a system such as this actually generates heat. And as the current increases, the amount of heat being generated also increases. And of course, as resistance increases, heat also increases as well. That electrical energy for our purposes is effectively uh, thermal energy, that power. And as resistance, let's say, on a poor electrical connection such as this gets larger, the amount of heat being generated gets larger, and then what we see here is revealed what appears to be a connection problem on this particular system. We see that because it's different than the others. Now, the temperature of which may or may not be accurate, we will talk about that here a little bit later, but just a very simple use there of infrared for electrical systems. It's not always the energized components, too. We also have fluid systems. Uh, maybe from a more mechanical perspective here, this is uh, the oil tubes, the oil fins on a transformer, showing us variations here in uh, temperature. The cooler tubes represent those that are where there's not oil flowing, perhaps. Perhaps there's a blockage or it's a low oil level. And so this heat exchange system here obviously not functioning as well as it could. And we're seeing an example of where cold is actually a problem. It's not always hot that we're looking for, these thermal patterns uh, that represent issues. It could be cool patterns as well. But in outdoor substations, IR has been utilized very successfully for decades, trying to find high resistance connections, let's say, on, on, on bushings, uh, bolted connections, whatnot lightning arresters, you name it, infrared used very successfully there, trying to find these thermal differences. Here we have a, a few oil-filled circuit breakers. Uh, we see here in this outdoor substation, if you notice there, the, the set of three there in the middle, we'll just call this A phase, B phase, and C phase, uh, that the A phase tank there, that oil-filled circuit breaker, looks appears to be warmer on the surface than the other two. That's indicating we've got some type of thermal anomaly that's occurring. Now, why that's happening, it, you know, we can't necessarily uh, pinpoint that with, uh, with thermal imaging, but the fact that we see a difference here is what's concerning, and that difference, don't be misled by that. If you notice there, the temperature is on the screen, 98 degrees versus 86. That's Fahrenheit. It's only a 13 degree Fahrenheit difference. It's actually a lot larger of a temperature difference. So uh, it's one of the things we have to understand here is we're not actually seeing the direct problem. Uh, this is more of an indirect related issue and in that that temperature inside that, that uh, tank is, is likely a lot hotter and, and on, its, uh, on its way to failure in a significant way. We can look at motors, electric motors here in this case. Look at the overall temperature of the motor to see if it's exceeded its insulation rating. We can look at the motor bearing to see if that bearing is heating up and perhaps needs a shot of grease. We can look at the motor junction box on the outside to get an indication potentially of a connection problem there on the inside. Many different things to look at here on a motor. It's not always necessarily going to pinpoint exactly what's happening with that motor. You know, for example, a motor bearing could be warm for several reasons, over lubricated, under lubricated. Perhaps it's just a bad bearing or maybe there's a misalignment issue. But infrared again gives us that data point, gives us a heads up that something is happening and that we need to investigate it more closely. 
We might have a few of you on from the petrochemical industry, perhaps, where you've got large tanks that you're uh, uh, having to manage in your maintenance program. Oftentimes, the gauges aren't the most reliable on these systems, and where infrared can come in here is actually help you locate things like a level inside a tank because the differences in thermal capacitance between, let's say, the gas and the liquid inside that tank, we can actually see a level that will come up in the right conditions. Of course, you need the right type of tank. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about emissivity-related issues here later on. Uh, doing this on, let's say, shiny stainless steel tanks is not very useful. Uh, but in this case here, with a tank with a painted surface and perhaps just a little bit of insulation, a single wall tank, we can very easily see these levels if we show up at, at the right time. We can also find things like sludge or sludge levels uh, in a tank as well. Very useful data point for, for those of you that are working in this type of application. Uh, belt drives, belts and shivs should run at or near ambient temperature. And if they're not, could be an indication that we've got a loose belt, maybe an over-tensioned belt, perhaps, an, again, a misalignment-related issue. Infrared, not going to exactly pinpoint what's happening there, but it does give you that data point that you want to look at this more closely because in this case here, this belt is running far too warm uh, in this situation. Something we want to look at more closely to try to diagnose and fix. Same thing with conveyor systems here. We've got bearings, conveyor roller belts here. This is obviously a great application for infrared where we can find these conveyor uh, problems uh, in many different types of industries. The hot spot there indicating we've got a problem with the failure of that, of that bearing there. Or perhaps in a refractory. In this case here, process monitoring where we've got a large rotary kiln. And of course, this large rotating furnace has a refractory insulation in there to obviously keep the skin temperature uh, 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 low. And then we've got here the situation where uh, the hot spots indicate areas where that refractory could potentially be breaking down, where we've got a greater transfer of thermal energy, something that an operator here would certainly, most certainly want to know to try and diagnose and catch this before it becomes a big issue. Another thing with uh, uh, thermography, for those of you that are getting into this, uh, it's not just about looking at the surfaces of objects, uh, let's say electrical connections or motors, perhaps. Uh, there are uh, applications which infrared can be used in gas detection, uh, actually used to find certain gases that are invisible to the eye. I want you to see this little video here. I'm going to play this through. It's a beautiful, clear day, visually nothing apparent there in the air. But with thermal imaging, we actually can see certain types of gases. Now, it depends on the wavelength. Uh, we can get more into that in our training classes here. Uh, but with the right type of infrared camera, you can find things like methane leaks, propane leaks, SF6 uh, leaks, SF6 and insulating gas used in electrical substations. Uh, I say ammonia too, right? Uh, all of this with a certain type of camera, which sees a very specific wavelength of infrared radiation. Uh, we have a whole gas find uh, series of cameras that are available that you can purchase, uh, and again, for very specific gas detection type applications. Things that would not show up, are not going to show up with your typical off-the-shelf, long-wave thermal imaging handheld camera. These are a very specific type of, uh, of camera with a very specific uh, tuning of that technology, but it is possible and used very successfully for obviously increasing safety and, and saving, uh, saving costs as well. Some types of infrared cameras are also used in furnaces to evaluate the efficiency of a burner inside a furnace, but also the furnace tubes. In this example here, we're looking inside an active furnace with a uh, mid-wave type of thermal imaging system uh, to actually evaluate these tubes. Uh, because what can happen here is you can have coking that builds up on the tubes on the inside there that can actually affect the efficiency of that furnace. Something also that is concerning for certain power generation plants, if it's a coal-fired power plant, uh, they get the, the residue from the combustion process of the coal. You get slag buildup that actually accumulates on the outside surfaces of these tubes, which can obviously create an energy efficiency issue, but these can also grow quite large, and if they were to break off, they can actually damage portions of that furnace. And so infrared is used to look inside here uh, to evaluate this. Now, your typical long-wave camera would not be able to do this because of the fact the flame is in the way, all this flame that you see visually. But in the mid-wavelengths here, we actually can see through the flame with the right type of filter 
and it actually removes that fire from the frame. And with that, we can very clearly evaluate the surface temperatures and more importantly, the patterns here on these tubes inside this furnace. As I said before, they also used to look at it for the efficiency of the burners as well. In the pulp and paper industry, uh, they might use infrared to look at uh, really the evaluation here of the, uh, the paper product. In this case here, the darker streaks indicate areas of the paper that might still be wet. Uh, when surfaces are wet, it induces evaporation. That evaporation actually cools off a material, and we can use a thermal imaging system here to see and evaluate uh, if we've actually properly dried the product in this case. Could be paper towels, toilet paper, printing paper, who knows. Uh, but for some reason, we're seeing some uh, non-uniformity here in these patterns, indicating the potential presence of moisture within the product. Thermal imaging also used for non-destructive testing applications in aerospace. You flew in an airplane. Very likely that airplane, when it went in for its major maintenance overhaul, perhaps they used some thermal imaging to try to detect uh, things like moisture intrusion into the airframe itself. That moisture can obviously create an issue with weight. Uh, more importantly, more concerning in many ways, is the fact that that moisture can uh, degrade the structural integrity of that aircraft over time. Uh, we also use infrared in uh, detecting uh, problems with delaminations and separations of a composite material, let's say. Those honeycomb structure materials that are used in a lot of military aircraft, also in the, uh, the new uh, the Boeing Dreamliner and, of course, the Airbus 350. Those composite materials over time, if there's a separation or damage or whatever, we can detect these with what's called flash or pulse active thermography to try and detect these structural deficiencies within the airframe before they obviously become major uh, issues. Not to be forgotten, building systems. A lot of you out there probably just listening today are doing building energy work, energy efficiency work, either checking for missing insulation, air leakage related issues, perhaps some moisture intrusion. Infrared since the 70s utilized very successfully to detect areas of missing insulation in a building. Of course, you need the right conditions, a good temperature difference, but summer or winter, you know, spring or fall, again, if you have the right conditions, uh, we, can, we can find these problems both in warm weather and in cold weather. In this case here, some missing insulation and cold weather that you see here on the right. Uh, that's obviously, we see the framing there being a little bit warmer, the cavity is a little bit cooler, indicating heat loss here from the inside to the outside. In this example here on the right, on the left, it's more warm weather where we see the level of insulation there on the wall showing up quite well. And again, I want to stress here, by the way, um, that one of the limitations of thermal imaging is that we cannot see beneath the surface. We're sort of relying on the surface patterns themselves to reveal subsurface thermal anomalies. And that's something that's a, an important point to emphasize is that uh, we're seeing sort of the, the effects of heat transfer showing up here on the surface. So infrared is not like this, this x-ray technology where you can see inside something. We're evaluating just what's happening here on the surface, not what's beneath the surface. That's something we like to uh, often emphasize as well. Infrared can also uh, is not able to find, or I should say in this case, cannot see air. Air is invisible to IR, but the effects of air leakage, whether the air is infiltrating here on the right inside here into the house and the, this door, or exfiltrating here on the left outside of this vent, is it heats up or cools off that surface, we can see these patterns that are created thermally to evaluate air leakage issues in a structure. Often infrared utilized in building systems along with what's called a blower door. It's basically a pressurization fan where you can either depressurize or pressurize a building and help actually diagnose air leakage related issues. In this case here around the knee wall attic access hatch in a residential home. Uh, showing up here very uh, apparently thermally uh, there along the top there we're seeing the effects of cold air coming in something that would not reveal itself uh, if we were not using that blower door. We can evaluate window performance in this case here are two windows that have lost their argon the argon has depleted over time creating a vacuum inside between the insulated glass units here and as that argon seeps out air molecules are not large enough to get back in. 
that creates a negative pressure which draws those panes together and now we've got a situation where the window has lost much of its performance here in the center because of that loss of argon. We've got more conductive heat flow now occurring at these points uh, than we'd have here at the other portions of the window. Uh, showing us, uh, again, a potential issue here with uh, these windows are not performing as well as they used to. Moisture, a big thing, certainly in buildings. Low slope roofs, pretty much, you know, many commercial facilities have what's called a low slope roof. Uh, there's a slight pitch to it, but it's very subtle. And these roofs, obviously susceptible to penetrations uh, because of damage, because of proper uh, improper, I should say, installation or whatever, the fact that they're exposed to the sun, a lot of wear and tear over time, you can have leaks that form and water can infiltrate here into a building and if it gets into that beneath the membrane there, it actually is soaked up by that insulation there, absorbed by that insulation beneath the membrane and if that's not addressed over time, obviously it's an energy efficiency related issue because the wet insulation uh, conducts more heat energy it's also a structural issue too for safety and the structural integrity of the building because that water over time can rust out the structural decking that's beneath it and literally rot the roof apart. And so this is something that we want to identify early on and can do very successfully with infrared uh, cameras. Here are some rain applications here. Uh, water intrusion into the hull of this vessel uh, perhaps this was damaged during a large storm, maybe it was a hurricane and we had the boat has run aground and now we've got some water infiltration in there. Uh, so we can find these again with the right conditions uh, with a thermal imaging camera. Really just a quick overview of just some of the applications that are out there. There's a lot more that we could go into and we do go into in our, in our, in our training classes. Uh, but I did want to spend some time here covering some of the basics of infrared training and provide for you, uh, those of you that are listening here, just uh, some value in terms of giving you some idea, an idea of what we have to deal with as thermographers. As I said before, you know, infrared cameras are great. I mean, they're, they're well designed, well made, easy to use, but interpreting the data, what you're seeing, is, a, is a much more difficult. The technology, it's, it's interpreting that image that is the most challenging aspect of the technology. You know, as the price of cameras have come down, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's obviously been very attractive for many people to get into the industry to purchase a thermal imager to use for a variety of applications. Uh, but you still have to know how to use that tool properly. I like to use the analogy of, a, of a, uh, like a framing or a claw hammer that you might see for your typical builder. Everyone has one of those in their garage, you know, a framing hammer. Very easy to use. It's a very inexpensive tool. Uh, but it takes a skilled carpenter to know how to frame a wall properly. And that's true with a thermal imaging system. Even with a three, dollars $400 camera, you might even have the new FLIR 1 perhaps, uh, you still have to understand some of the basics of physics. So even though a tool might be inexpensive, it doesn't necessarily translate in the ease of use in terms of interpreting that data. And that's where the training comes in and why getting uh, certified is very important. For example, knowing how to properly focus absolutely critical uh, not only to resolve sort of resolve detail on the surface of an object but also for the purposes of temperature measurement let me roll this video through here this was actually taken in our lab here in our Nashua New Hampshire training facility this is a cutout that you might see on top of a uh, telephone pole uh, train on one of those telephone poles outside and what we have here is a spot temperature on the surface showing us the maximum temperature of about 103 degrees Celsius it's about 200, uh, 216, 15 Fahrenheit or so. Pretty rough translation there. Uh, if you were to see this actually in real life, if you work for a utility, or perhaps this was at your plant and this was outside uh, your uh, facility and you saw this, this would certainly be a problem that you would report. But I want to show you how critical having that focus is on this. If you pull this out of focus ever so slightly, notice how it gets soft right there. That temperature drops about 12 or 13 degrees Celsius. Multiply that by about two, and that's your degree Fahrenheit drop. That is not an insignificant amount. Uh, and it's amazing just what not having perfect focus will do to the quality of your image. So in our training classes, we emphasize, obviously, the, the importance of focus, getting great focus on your image to get the best possible data. So out-of-focus images, you know, if it's, if it's the out-of-focus, you're not going to be getting an accurate reading. 
tuning the image, thermally tuning it. In this case here, adjusting what's called the span and level, very important as well. If the scale, which you see on the screen of your thermal Im imager perhaps, either on the, in the camera itself or in the software, if that scale is too wide, um, you're going to potentially miss critical hotspots. Uh, in the course of your inspection. In this case here, it's an outdoor substation. On the left, the image has been auto-adjusted by the thermographer with the camera. What that auto-adjust is, is it automatically sets the scale here. The scale is called the span. And the width of that span directly affects how much contrast we're going to have here on the image. And if the span is too wide, in this case here, about 30 degrees Celsius, um, we're very likely going to walk by a very critical issue. Now, why it's that wide here in this case is because we're getting most of the sky in the frame. We're seeing a lot of the clouds, uh, some of the atmosphere here, pretty much looking out into deep space where there's clear sky. And that deep space is pretty cold. And what's going to happen there, if you're just auto-adjusting here with your camera, using that auto-tuning, um, you're going to walk by, as you see here on the right, the manually tuned image where we've narrowed that scale down considerably. It's a critical hotspot there that was, that was uh, probably going to be missed. You figure you're outside on a sunny day and you're looking at the LCD screen, it's going to be hard to see that on the display there. You might walk right by that if you don't manually tune that image to get a better uh, contrast there on the scene. So we work on this again as part of training, getting good tuned, well thermally tuned images here uh, as part of the certification process. And it's true for those of you in buildings. Let's say you're looking for missing insulation here on the roof of this residential home. The manually tuned image here on the right provides much better detail as to what's really going on. We actually see that most of that roof in these particular conditions appears to be uninsulated. But on the left here, in the auto-tuned image, where we haven't adjusted that scale, we get most of the sky there in the frame, and there's a tree there in the backyard. Uh, that 100 degree, almost 100 degree, degree span there, we're losing a lot of that contrast on the surface of that roof and as such are not able to diagnose what's happening at all. So proper image adjustment, very important. And then we get into a lot of the physics of heat transfer in our level one training classes. In this case here, how infrared radiation behaves. We see some electrical connections here, and on the left what appears to be potentially a connection problem perhaps. Well, what we learn here in training though is that you know, infrared radiation, just like visible light radiation, can reflect off of objects. If you get up in the morning and go to your bathroom and look in the mirror above your sink, you're seeing a visible light reflection. Well, out here in the field, shiny unpainted metal surfaces, in this case here, these connections that are shiny and metallic, reflect infrared radiation in the same way. Those photons of energy will bounce off of that, what we call a low emissivity surface, and in this case here, it's actually a reflection of the thermographer who's actually standing there opposite of these connections. And, and in very ways, will be very confusing sometimes to tell whether or not the hotspot you're looking at is legitimate or not. And just by moving, we can identify the fact that this is, is a false hotspot. It's a thermal reflection, something that we have to deal with, and that's why we emphasize that in training. Here we see a thermal reflection off of a wood floor. This is in a residential home. You notice here the image of a door reflecting off of that floor. Well, we're actually trying to find the radiant floor heating system here. We can sort of barely make that out in this example here. But the reflection of other sources of energy in the room, because again, everything emits infrared radiation. And it depends on the emissivity and reflectivity of the surface, depends on how it's going to react here thermally. It can make things very confusing sometimes. We have to understand these important relationships. I had alluded to some of the labs in our training room here in Nashua before, or at our Boston Regional Training Center. One of them that we use is this sort of bare metal lab, this bus bar lab here. These are uh, really two little pieces of copper, sort of a sample pieces of copper bus that we've rigged up here in one of our lab kits. And one of these is actually, it's not energized, there's actually a resistance heater in there. So we can actually heat this surface up to create a temperature difference that you can then evaluate with your infrared camera. It's one of our more popular labs that we utilize here at our training facility. But it's a great lab to not only demonstrate things like emissivity, but in this case here, reflectivity. 
and showing you again how reflective the thermographer can be and showing up on the surfaces that you're trying to inspect. On the left here, an image that's well focused. What you would take, what you would expect to normally capture if you were actually imaging this for real in the field. But on the right here, I've actually focused on the reflection. And as you can see here, thermal patterns of my hands, the camera, and even the tripod that the camera is resting on are all picked up off the surface of this uh, mock-up of bus. If you were in the field, you would see a very similar reaction. Of course, this makes it very difficult to try to evaluate, well, how hot is that surface? Because when you're looking at it here, from this perspective, that spot temperature is going to pick up all of those reflections off of that surface. And I actually threw some temperatures on there. I just set an emissivity arbitrarily to one just to get an overall view of what that reflection is in this case here. And what we've got, obviously, are temperature differences ranging anywhere from about 23 degrees Celsius all the way up to 35 degrees Celsius. So a 20 to 25 degree Fahrenheit variance there in just the reflected background alone, which can make evaluating the thermal patterns very problematic, but also making temperature measurements difficult, if not impossible. And not to be obviously overlooked in all this is the emissivity of the material, how efficiently that surface can radiate thermal energy. Uh, emissivity and reflectivity uh, sort of have a relationship such as this, that surfaces with a high emissivity value have a low reflectivity value. And those with a high reflectivity value have a low emissivity value. In this case here, the low emissivity is the fuse caps that you see here on these fuses on the right. We notice the temperatures that we've taken off of these, 72.4 Fahrenheit on what we'll call the A phase, and 78 degrees here on the C phase. It's about a six degree temperature difference or so. Or is it? You notice the fused bodies, which have a much higher emissivity and a much lower reflectivity. It's about 91 degrees there on the first phase and 125 on the C phase. It's about a 34 degree Fahrenheit temperature difference or so. So depending on where you put that spot temperature, you're going to get a different temperature reading because of the different emissivities. And this is something that, you know, in theory, we can adjust the emissivity in the camera to try to, try to compensate for that. Uh, but we find it's, it's done a lot more easily in theory than it is necessarily done in practice. Let me show you another, another example here going back to this bus bar lab that we have set up here. I took two area boxes here showing you the apparent temperature difference between the, the top phase and the bottom phase. If you notice there in the upper left hand corner there, it appears to be I think what about a five degree temperature difference or so there. Looks like 80 on the top phase and 75 on the bottom. So again, five degrees apparent difference there in this example. Uh, but that's not adjusting for emissivity of, uh, at all. What I want to focus on here more importantly, though, is the pattern, the fact that there's a very subtle difference between the two, and it doesn't look like that they're that much different. But again, this is a low emissivity surface, so it's not emitting its energy very efficiently at all. In fact, it's, it's a very poor emitter and a very good thermal reflector. So most of what you're seeing here really has nothing to do with the actual temperature of these two surfaces. If I put a piece of electrical tape across the two, though, this is just your regular Scotch 33. It happens to be blue in this case. A lot of you would use black, but you can buy any color that you want. It has a good known consistent emissivity of about 0.95 or 95%. That means it's very good at radiating its energy off of its surface. And if I put that across those two phases of that bus, here's what we now see for apparent temperatures. It's not a 5 degree temperature difference. It's about a 70, 75 perhaps, even more delta T between the top phase and the bottom phase. That's huge. And that's something, again, we have to stress to people that you have to know what you're doing. You have to understand the physics behind what these cameras are seeing. Because oftentimes, objects will lie to you. It's not that the infrared camera isn't working properly. It's that the physics are what are confusing you potentially here and the fact that low E surfaces do not radiate their heat well. And whether you have a, a, a $250 you know, attachment for your phone or perhaps maybe a twenty dollars to $25,000 high-end commercial imaging camera, let's say for long wave for industrial facilities maintenance, the problem's the same. It's the same issue with physics and you have to know that and that's why, we, again, we stress the need for training.
in terms of resolution, the ability to resolve certain thermal details at a certain distance, uh, certain sized objects. All infrared cameras have a very specific and defined resolution that you have to understand, just like the optical resolution of your eyes. Anybody been here to the eye doctor recently? Take an eye test, you know, you sit up there, you cover one eye, and you look at a chart, and you try to find the smallest letter that you can still easily read. Well, that's a test of the resolution of your eyes. Infrared cameras are really no different, except this case here, we're trying to resolve areas of a certain size of thermal detail, a certain size hot spot, or perhaps cold spot. And the farther you are away from something, the more difficult it can be to actually capture the detail on that object. You see, the infrared image is made up of pixels. These detectors inside an infrared camera have sensors that are, that are built onto them. They're the size of a small microchip, a little bit smaller than your fingernail, your tiny fingernail there. And packed on them are thousands and thousands of these infrared sensors. You know, if you think about you know, if you have an iPhone or a droid out there, you've got a digital visual camera in that device. Well, there's a, a CMOS detector, right? There's a little chip back there that detects visible light. And packed on that might be millions of pixels. You know, I've got an iPhone 5S here, and it's uh, got an 8 megapixel camera in it. There's 8 million detectors inside on that little chip there that sense visible light. Well, an infrared camera works in a very similar way. But instead, it's a, a detector that sees infrared light, or in this case, infrared radiation. And so depending on the size of what we call the focal plane array, the array, which is the array of pixels on that detector there, is partly what defines how much resolution you have for your particular imaging system. In this example here, this is a 320 by 240 focal plane array infrared camera, which means there's 320 detectors across the horizontal and 240 on the vertical. And all those together are what create the image. Of course, it's the lens that focuses that energy onto that detector array. That's important because here's what we got here, the image being made up of pixels. How many detectors you have directly affects how much detail you could capture at a given distance. In this example here, we have two different infrared imaging systems, both with the same field of view. That is the size, both horizontally and vertically, of the frame that we're seeing here. However, one camera on the left is an 80 by 60. The other on the right is a 640 by 480. And standing at the same distance with the same field of view, you can see directly here the difference in terms of how much detail you might pick up from one imager to another. So understanding that, how many detectors you have, is really critical. Of course, though, it's the field of view, and what we call the instantaneous field of view, is what defines what we get for our resolution. Because remember, we've got the lens here that's part of this process. It's the lens that focuses the infrared energy onto that detector array. And so in this example here, uh, we have to understand here is that every pixel is measuring a certain sized portion of that field of view, depending on what type of lens you have and at what distance you are standing from that target. So what I mean by that here is we have three different examples. All three were taken with the same 320 by 4, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, 320 by 240 focal plane array. The middle image here is with the standard lens, a 24 degree lens in this case here. And this image again is comprised of 320 pixels across the horizontal and 240 on the vertical. On the left is a telephoto lens, a 12 degree lens. We've got half the field of view there. And on the right is a wide angle lens, a 45 degree lens. Still though, only 320 by 240. So the pixels in all of these three images here are measuring a distinctly different portion of that field of view, which directly translates into how much resolution you might have, not only for seeing thermal patterns, but also for measuring temperatures. So understanding these field of view differences between the types of lenses that you might happen to be using are very important. So if you're in the market for an infrared camera, and, and I see a lot of you here again, are novices or brand new to the technology, this is something to consider. You know, are you looking at things that are typically further away? Let's say larger uh, buildings, perhaps, residential here, or maybe commercial facilities, or you work for a utility? Uh, you might want to invest in a telephoto lens, a 12-degree lens, let's say, to put on your infrared camera so that you can capture more of that detail from a greater distance. That can be a really important uh, uh, consideration for those of you in the market for purchasing a camera. And of course, this goes down to the spot radiometers, or in this case here, an infrared imaging thermometer. 
such as the spot thermal camera here, the TG165 uh, from FLIR. Uh, this obviously measures temperature, but at what distance? It depends. This spot meter has what's called a 24 to 1 distance to spot size ratio. And what that means is that 24, in this case here, centimeters away from a target, you're actually measuring a one centimeter spot. And it could be inches. At two feet, you're measuring a one inch target. But the further you are away, the larger an area you are measuring. And so what happens here is not only do you lose your ability to resolve detail as distance increases, it also affects temperature measurement. Let's go back to that cutout for a second in our lab here at our Boston Regional Training Center. We see a target on here, a black tape target right here. That's actually where we're going to put that spot. That's a bit of electrical tape, some Scotch 33. And here's what it looks like at a distance of about, oh, three to five feet. We see a uh, measurement here of about 99 degrees uh, Celsius. And we can see the spot there. What's important to note here at this distance is the spot is completely enveloped by the target, completely fills up that circle there on the inside. It's giving us an accurate temperature reading because, again, that temperature up top there is comprised of all of that data inside that circle. And so the target is completely filling that circle up, and that's a good way to sort of get a rough idea if you're getting sufficient resolution. But if we back up, let's say, across the room, in this next sequence I took it about 30 feet away here, looking at the same cutout right there on the wall, you'll notice now as we zoom in digitally, that that circle is measuring a much, much larger area. And we're getting here, obviously, a lower temperature reading. Notice the temperature has dropped oh, about 25 degrees Celsius or so. It's because we're averaging in all of those temperatures right there, and we're getting a false temperature reading there because of less resolution. So understanding this is something we do, again, talk about in our training classes, and you have to really experience for yourself to get an understanding here on the resolution. You know, you're out there in that substation. What's the size of the spot you're measuring at a given distance? Something that's very important. How big is that spot? The further you are away, the less accurate your temperature reading will be. And of course, for those of you in buildings, can you see smaller areas of air leakage or missing insulation at the distance from which you're working from? I mentioned indirect heating before. This is a, a cool little lab that we've got here. It's a, it's a metal box, a painted metal box with an incandescent light bulb on the inside. And we actually turn this on and let this, this, let this heat up. And on the outside here, 114 degrees Fahrenheit is the maximum temperature that we see on the surface. And inside, it's well over 320 degrees. You know, we all, I, get a, I get this question a lot, and it's, it's troublesome. It's concerning because you, you wonder... Uh, you know, a thermographer that will call me and will ask about, you know, I'm inspecting electrical panels. Uh, and, I, and I'm not removing covers because I was told I can't. And, of course, there's a safety issue there. If we do remove covers, you have to practice proper safety procedures. If you're here in the States, you're following NFPA 70E. Uh, not just anyone removes a cover. You have to be a qualified electrician. Uh, but we need that direct line of sight. We can't see problems through closed panels. Uh, you're not going to see it. People often will say, well, if it's, if it's bad enough, if it's serious enough, it'll show up, and that's unfortunately not true. As we see here, an over 200 degree difference just from this simple little box that we've got set up here. Check out this uh, small little panel board we have in our lab. On the outside, you can see the surface temperature here of uh, the box here on the left. It's about average room temperature there, about 22 degrees. It's about, what, 74, 75 Fahrenheit. Don't really see much at all, do you? If I take that cover off, though, there's a connection there on the inside that's well over. Wow, look at that, 89 degrees there. It's the maximum temperature, temperature there on that connection. That's a very significant problem if you were to find that in the field. But again, you need that direct line of sight to see that. Check out this example here. 46 Celsius on the left. That's a 115 degree problem on top of that breaker. On the right, over 700 degrees. We need that direct line of sight. It is a, um, uh, a myth that we can see through panels. We need to have that direct line of sight. But if you're doing that, of course, safety becomes uh, absolutely paramount. And we've got to practice safely. And you only are doing this if you're qualified. But we need that direct line of sight there to get the most accurate assessment of what's happening. Another example here is a load tap changer coming off a transformer. You see any type of heating on that load 
tap changer could be an indication of a very serious problem. In this case here, only about a 17 degree Fahrenheit temperature difference, and on the inside, it's, it's game over. Copper melted about what, 2,000 degrees? Aluminum, 1,200? Depends on what metal was that, what was there. Uh, it's just now a melted mess of, of something that's all charred up. Uh, it's not a 17 degree Fahrenheit difference. It was hundreds and hundreds of degrees warmer. Infrared windows do provide a nice, safe alternative to having to remove covers. You can use infrared windows. I know FLIR makes infrared windows. Uh, it's a great way to qualitatively evaluate problems through closed panels. But again, you have to understand the physics behind how infrared windows work. They're not 100% transmissive. Something else that we cover in our training classes here. This is one of the labs here with all these various infrared windows that are set up here on the panel. And we notice the difference here, that the measured transmissivity of two of these windows, it's about 50 to 60%, maybe closer to 70% there. It's not 100% transmissive. If you notice here on the right, this lower right one here, that's actually an empty hole. That is the true uh, temperature there of that surface. And you notice here how these windows actually, the surface behind here, which is all the same uniform temperature, actually looks cooler. It's not. It's just the windows are not allowing 100% of that radiation to transfer through. Wind is another, another thing we talk about. Convective cooling. Any type of air currents can convectively cool off or heat a surface up depending upon the temperature of the surface and the temperature of the fluid, in this case the air. And as little as a 3 degree temperature, uh, excuse me, a 3 degree, or a, let me say that again, a 3 mile an hour uh, breeze or light wind, three miles an hour, can cut your temperature difference in half. As little as a three mile an hour wind will cut your temperature difference in half. So if you're inspecting in windy conditions, you're not getting an accurate assessment of what the temperature of that surface is. And we did a really good example here in our classes with just a simple hair dryer and a cup warmer. This hair dryer and cup warmer demo is one of my favorite ones. I've done it for years where I can set this up and actually turn the cup warmer on, heat it up to a very uniform temperature as you see here, and then blow ambient air with the hair dryer across that surface using its ambient air button. I want you to see what happens here as this thing moves. Let me play this here. As I turn on that hair dryer, you're going to watch that temperature start to drop. Now I've sped this up just a little bit. We started off at about 212 Fahrenheit. Right, it was a little bit hotter than that, and now we're down to 70 degrees Celsius here. It gets down to about, it goes from about 220 to 230 all the way down to about 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. It basically cools it off enough that you, that you can touch it. It cools it off enough that you can actually put your hand on it, feel the surface, and not get burned by that because of that fluid velocity there, that cooling actually cools down that surface enough. And so imagine you're looking at disconnects in an outdoor substation or connections inside air conditions, uh, air conditioned mechanical rooms with switch gear. You're going to see these, uh, this, this effect will be happening and certainly can cause you to misinterpret a problem. Uh, there's much, much more. Unfortunately, we don't have time to really go into all of this. We're just trying to give you a taste of it, of course. Uh, but if you want more information, of course, our website, infraredtraining.com for the ITC. You can register for training classes, sign up for our newsletter. We've got a blog that's very active on there as well. Our webinars, uh, today's live webcast, by the way, is being recorded. We're going to have this available for playback at a later date, so you can, obviously, if you miss part of this or have a colleague or a friend you'd like to have listen to this, we'll post this in the next week or two up onto the ITC website. We also have more live webcasts coming up. I'll bring back the uh, camera here, because Jason's going to have some questions here in a moment. Uh, besides uh, ITC and our resources there, we also have our conference, Information. We're going to be in Las Vegas coming up in September of 2016. It is really the leading IR training experience out there. Uh, you know, We certainly would encourage you to consider getting trained, at least level one certified, but if you want to go learn and meet, have fun, and really get a feel for what the world of infrared is, information is really the best place to go. You get about 400 attendees, I think, Jason, right, at our last event in Nashville. At least. Yeah. 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 
what a great event. I think 60 some odd different presentations, poster sessions, uh, clinics, your peers basically uh, presenting on their discoveries in the world of thermal imaging. Uh, the networking opportunities are really endless. It is a lot of fun, but you learn a lot. And we're going to be in Las Vegas coming up in September. It's the 26th to the 29th, so save the date there for Information 2016. We'll probably have a call for papers here going out a little bit later this year. And of course, anybody who's attended this webcast today, if you uh, join us here in the States, you can get 10% off any USA ITC training course. Just use the promo code EBDWeb. You can call us on our 866 number or email us and register for any of our classes that we have on the schedule there at infraredtraining.com. 10% off for those of you that have attended today's live webinar just as a thank you for your time. And as I mentioned, more infrared ed coming up here in the, the coming months. We're going to have uh, new live topics that are already scheduled actually. They're up for registration at infraredtraining.com slash webinars. We'll be back here in a little bit with John Wagoner, who's our resident uh, electrical safety expert who's going to have an overview of NFPA 70E and IR and electrical safety and ask the expert session coming up later. Uh, Jason, in fact, uh, are going to be here probably what, early August, right? I think August 7th. For FLIR Tools. Yeah, FLIR yep. Tools. Yep. Jason's going to be on with uh, two great presentations there, the basics of FLIR Tools and then also the advanced features. Uh, just quickly, I don't know if you want to briefly yeah. mention. Um, yeah, the, the FLIR Tools basics, what we call is the free software. Um, so we'll spend about an hour going through just as if you were a new user. So we go through the import process, how to analyze your images, how to make a report. Um, so we'll go through it from start to finish. Um, the advanced touches on Tools Plus. Um, the Plus upgrade gives you the Word add-in so you can make your own templates. Um, we'll, we'll probably spend most of the time on the Word aspect of Tools Plus, um, but we'll touch on panorama and sequence recording and some of the other features you get with Plus. So we divided it up into two because we can really dedicate more time to the Word templates. We get a lot of questions about that. So by separating it out, you know, we spend an hour on the free software and an hour on the Plus software. So uh, if you have any, you know, interest in that, um, please join us. I believe it's in uh, August. August 7th, uh, yeah. So um, you can check it online. Uh, to be sure, but yeah. It's great. Now, Jason's done some great work on, on that content. It's really worth your time, especially if you're having any questions or any, any concerns with how to use that software. It is, it, it's a very important part of the imaging process is, 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 is actually pr producing your reports and processing those images after you've captured uh, those anomalies. And then I've got a new topic here, Rusty Boucher, joining us for HVAC and IR uh, inspection basics. That's going to be coming up later, I believe, in August. It's been a, a, a highly requested topic, so we're, we're happy to finally offer that. And of course, some others there as well, capturing great thermal images. We'll have an overview of the researcher software and IR for mechanical applications as well. All coming up, all recorded, and will be posted also on demand after they run at infraredtraining.com slash webinars. And for those of you that perhaps are joining us later this afternoon right now from the UK, uh, thermal image interpretation on Wednesday, the 16th of September. John Willis out of our UK office will be back for another live event there. And we also have more French live webcasts coming up. Uh, that's actually in French with our instructor Sylvain uh, from France. He'll be doing those. We'll have some dates announced on those very soon as well. There are some on-demand ones currently available on our European website for EMEA at irtraining.eu. All right. Questions? Jason's been well, typing keep, feverishly over here. Leaving the camera. <laughs> what, no worries. What, uh, what do we see? We had a few that came in there. Yeah, we did have uh, a question about the environmental conditions, such as if you're in a from a mechanical application in a room full of other heat sources. Yeah. Um, that can get complex, particularly if the emissivity is low. Oh, absolutely. Right, reflections become a factor. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to probably address specifically, but are there some things that people can look out for, just generally speaking. Yeah, probably the, the big thing there for mechanical equipment is getting a proper baseline of the component. It's really where the value of infrared is in, let's say, looking at an electric motor, is you baseline that electric motor. And what a baseline is, is, is capturing a series of thermal images while that motor is in its most steady state, normal operating condition, which you would then take those images to use to compare future subsequent inspections against. And so obviously the ambient temperature comes into consideration there. 
you know, if you baseline a motor in the middle of January, let's say here in North America, and it's you know 40 degrees outside and it's early in the morning, uh, that could look very different from let's say the middle of July on a on a Wednesday in the afternoon when it's much hotter. So certainly that's one of the things that's trying to baseline that is is a challenge. And unfortunately, I don't have you know I can't say exactly uh, you know how that's going to work out, particularly in, in this person's situation who's asking the question. So certainly, though, the ambient environmental temperatures can certainly affect that. But also, if you have lower emissivity surfaces, radiation coming off of uh, the heat off of a boiler, off of a light, uh, off of other motors, let's say, all potentially if you're measuring temperatures, certainly needs, needs to be understood, needs to be quantified if you're measuring temperature. It's what we really didn't go into that here a lot because of time, and obviously the topic is really outside the scope. If you're measuring temperatures with an infrared camera, you, you got to get to class. I just, it's not, I'm not trying to upsell you. I'm just telling you the reality. It's, it can be complex. Yeah. Um, and there are, I suppose, environmental factors as well. Um, humidity, particularly distance, um, maybe yep. not as important as emissivity, but still something to consider. The emissivity um, and the reflectivity are going to really get you into trouble if you don't understand what's yeah. going on. Yeah. So. Uh, but a good question. And yeah. for, for, for buildings, uh, same issue. For those of you that are building thermographers, the sun, solar loading is a big problem. So the time of day when you show up, uh, you could literally be in a situation where a wall looks completely insulated in the morning, uh, but that same building, that same you know customer, in the afternoon that wall might appear to be completely uninsulated because the effects of solar loading have caused the thermal patterns to reverse and a wall that appeared to be full now suddenly appears to be empty and completely missing insulation. So, good question, but what else we got? Um, we had a question about scanning pneumatic cylinders and servos, and I'm not oh. at all familiar with this. And I haven't had any experience okay. with those. All right. Maybe with something under Ron or yeah. somebody. Um, whoever, ans or, I'm sorry, whoever asked that, please email us at the email address on the screen there, webinars at infraredtraining.com. Um, we can forward that question to somebody who has a little more experience with that, and they can probably give you some uh, some guidance. Yeah, not something I have any personal direct experience with, so I don't want to okay. give them a, give them the wrong answer. So. No, we can put you in touch with someone who yeah. has a little more expertise in that area. They can probably give you some uh, some assistance. Okay. Yeah. Um, tank levels. Tank levels. Uh, detecting tank levels. Yeah. It is possible under the right conditions, I believe. It is possible under the right conditions. Uh, what can be difficult, obviously, or impossible, is a stainless steel tank. So I don't know if you're working in a brewery or some type of food or agricultural type operation where you've got, you know, obviously lots of stainless steel. You're not going to see anything there unless, of course, you paint a nice high emissive stripe down the side. Uh, double wall tanks, not impossible, but certainly very difficult because you obviously have that air gap in between the two tanks. And so you don't have a, a uh, there's, you need thermal bridging essentially uh, for this to happen where there's a direct connection from the inside uh, surface and material to the outside. But a single wall tank, maybe with a little bit of insulation, it's a painted surface on the outside, uh, typically uh, easily done with the right conditions, which could be early in the morning or more towards the afternoon. It's really catching the fluids, that is the gases or the liquids, while they're going through a thermal transient. And so what happens here is the gas uh, changes temperature more easily throughout a given day because of its lower capacitance for heat. So it warms up really easily and cools off really easily. The liquid having a higher capacitance for heat takes longer to heat up and then longer to cool off. It actually doesn't ch change temperature much, to be honest. Uh, and so you want to catch this. So early in the morning, uh, the let's say the liquid inside a tank might appear to be warmer and the gas cooler. But early afternoon, midday, it might be the opposite, where uh, the gas is warmer and the liquid's cooler. It's that middle of the road, sort of the 10 a.m., 9, 10 a.m., which, again, depends, where you might see the same temperature throughout across the whole surface. And in that case there, I always like to joke, it's about how optimistic is one. You know, is it half full or half empty? Is it all, is it all the way full or all the way empty? Um, it depends. And so if you don't see anything, it's always good to wait a little bit, try again. Uh, but it's really capacitance and conduction that is driving these patterns that are showing up. That's why sludge can show up as well, because it too has a different thermal capacitance. Uh, that's really sort of a quick 101 there on yeah. tanks. Sort of the same physics that applies to roof inspections. It really is. Moisture, yeah. yeah, it yeah. is a capacitance-driven inspection, yeah. Right. Um, had a question about termite insect damage. Yeah. We get this question sometimes. Um, 
Do you want to touch on that? Subtle delta temperatures, I mean, very, very subtle patterns that you might see. You need a really narrow span. A camera with great thermal sensitivity yeah. is really important. You wouldn't detect the insects themselves. They're just no. far too small, but yeah. you could potentially detect any damage that they may have caused. They basically change the density of the building material. So when you change the density, you're changing the capacitance. And that change in density is what's going to cause the thermal patterns that, 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 let's say, the joist will either warm up or cool off differently from where the areas are not affected. Uh, but, and if there's moisture involved, too, then that's also driving it as well. But you would need a fair amount of thermal uh, or temperature difference between the inside and outside to be able to have some... And even then, it's having a good sensitivity, like a yeah. low millikelvin rating, yep. you know, on your camera. You know, well, you wouldn't want to get like a hundred millikelvin camera or one hundred and fifty. I mean, you want something that's high res camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Just because it is subtle. And then again, we're, you know, this is just going back to moisture too. Uh, infrared is great, but there again, there are limitations to how we can apply it. And so things like termites or moisture, you really don't confirm that with thermal imaging, moisture especially. We find patterns that are associated with the presence of moisture. But you really take something like a moisture meter, and FLIR makes the MR77, uh, which you would use to then confirm that presence of moisture. You basically see the thermal patterns, and then you actually use the moisture meter to confirm what, in fact, the thermal is showing you. So that's just something there. And there's also the MR160, which also has a built-in infrared camera now, too, which is yeah. another, another possibility. Yeah. Um, I had a, just a sort of a general question about how to about determining the proper emissivity for an electrical component. Yeah. Obviously beyond the scope of, of this session uh, yeah. because it depends on the material and many other factors. Yeah. So uh, definitely a good level one topic. Um, Great level one topic. Uh, really to, to know emissivity you have to quantify it and you do that there's a specific procedure to actually measure the emissivity of a surface. Uh, Emissivity tables, we generally like to say avoid those. Uh, they're really, they're at best a guide. Uh, more likely they're going to get you into trouble because of the, 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 the values that are, that are derived at in an emissivity table, and you'll find these in some cameras, you'll certainly find them online. Uh, you Google emissivity, you'll get 300,000 hits with different emissivity tables that'll come up. Uh, those, those values are determined, uh, who knows first off what they were testing, where they were testing it, when it was tested, but also the wavelength of the camera, the temperature of the material when they did the test. Uh, there's all these variations in there. There's conditional issues too. Often emissivity tables will, will have a value that's very absolute. For example, you know, 0.28 or whatever that is. And then they'll put next to it a descriptor that's very subjective, like oxidized somewhat, weathered heavily, uh, you know, faded or whatever it is and and those arbitrary subjective adjectives that are being used obviously uh, Jason and I would come up with different values for that so those tables again really take with a grain of salt not ideal you really have to quantify emissivity by actually measuring it and there's a procedure to do that which unfortunately is outside the scope of this presentation but really you really need to be a level one for that yeah. Um, we had another question, and I get this question often about how far a camera can see or what's the smallest object that can be detected by the camera. You touched on that. Yeah. IFOV depends on the resolution, the lens, it defines the IFOV parameter. Yep. But I wanted to mention that all the camera data sheets have this parameter on them. Um, if you have a FLIR camera, all the data sheets are at the support site. So if you go to support.flir.com, you can find your camera data sheet it shows you that IFOV parameter. That's the minimum detectable mm -hmm. object size. If you multiply by that, what, like three or four? Three or four, or, four if you want to be really conservative. Oh, yeah. So yeah. if you're measuring temperatures, you multiply by three or four, that gives you an estimate for the measurement field to be the smallest, also known as spot size, smallest measurable spot size. Yeah. We have a field of view calculator on that website, so you can actually determine, based on your lens resolution, et cetera, how far away yeah. Or, or the smallest thing that you can detect at a given distance. So if you have any sort of questions about the smallest thing that you can detect or measure, check the data sheet and um, use the field of view calculator because it, it works really well and it will give you an estimate of how far, approximately how far away you can be and still get good results. So That's and, a great resource. Yeah, and other camera vendors publish the IFOV too, so if you have a different camera, you can always find that parameter. So I just wanted to no, absolutely. Thank that. you. Thank we you. get that question quite a bit. 
Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Or, uh, uh, we will publish this. A lot of people are asking. Um, we're going to publish the presentation, the recorded version yep. of this at infotraining.com. So check back in a few days or a week or so. We'll have it up there in the webinars. We'll back up. All, it'll section. be up on this page here. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Excuse me. Hopefully, that's assuming the recording went well. I think so far, I haven't had anybody uh, uh, complaining about audio. So hopefully, if the audio is good, we will put this up. So infertraining.com/webinars for more information. There. Any other questions? Um, or? What was the discount code again? Oh, the EBD, EBD Web, EBD Dash Web. Uh, just give us a call. Uh, uh, Jen Tangway here in our office uh, will likely pick that up. Uh, and just read that back to her. Let her know that you attended today's webinar, and we can extend you that discount. Uh, absolutely. We'd love to have you join us here for training. And if you have any other questions, if we've missed your question for whatever reason, you can certainly email us at the info underscore us at FLIR.com. Um, you know, other than that, yep. anything, uh, any last-minute questions? Let's make sure we got everybody. Because we can always come back here, like I said, offline if you want to talk to us. Oh, no worries. Yeah, some there are a few questions that are a bit more complex probably than maybe we'll grab those offline. Yeah, okay. yeah. If we didn't get to your question, please email us. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the questions that come come in require a little bit more follow up and maybe a little bit more information about what you're doing, so we can give you some better advice. So please uh, email us. Um, Great. With anything that that we didn't answer. And we'll well, I know you guys are really busy. I don't want to keep you on here. We've, we've gone over a little bit, but we're happy to hang around. So I mean, if you have any questions, I'm glad we could, we could address those. Uh, but I know it's a busy day. You guys want to get out for the weekend, probably. Uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you for your help, Jason. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, we'll be back online again here, folks, in the coming weeks with more live webcasts. Of course, go to infraredtraining.com slash webinars uh, to sign up for those. And as Jason said, you can also access the on-demand sessions there as well. On behalf of my colleague, Jason Gagnon, I'm Matt Schwegler with IT.